Thank you. I, I, I want to thank uh, all of the organizers. I, I want to thank Merge uh, and, and the church uh, for organizing this. this morning. Okay, I'm going to grab my stuff and uh, get on with it. Hang on. Okay, the reason, the only reason I'm invited here <laughs> it really is because I wrote this book. I'm, I'm a writer. I, so, uh, yeah, I'm the reporter. I'm a court stenographer, okay? And uh, Monty, on the other hand, was the defense attorney, the prosecuting attorney, the judge, and the jury. So I'm the court stenography. But, but, and I haven't done this for a while. I haven't spoken um, uh, to an audience for a while. Actually, last week, okay, two weeks ago, I was in Yetin. I don't know. Raise your hand if you've been to Yetim. You have? Wow, this many people have been to Yetim? So you were amazed, right? Astonished? Okay, so it's, it's an inspirational event. Oh, oh no way. You know, then they know the, oh yeah. If you're, if you're an ask the person, you, you've been there. Anyway, I, I spoke there, and that was the first time in a long time. It's the second time in a long time that I've spoken to, um, uh, you know, to an audience about uh, on this occasion, but it's it's, it's appropriate. So uh, yeah, the twenty fifth was Saturday, and so Monty would have been sixty years old, six zero, sixty years old uh, uh, on Saturday. But he wasn't. Yeah, I mean, if you knew him as a kid, you'd know he wasn't going to turn sixty. This, <laughs> you know, he wasn't the kind of guy who was going to turn sixty. So um, it was amazing, though, that he lasted that long. It's amazing that he lasted 35 and a half years. I mean, he came a, a lot of close calls, and, and I, 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 I uh, described a couple of the close calls in the book. So the book is this, it's the first edition, it's in a paperback edition. I ordered a bunch for this event. Um, they haven't arrived yet, so I don't have books. I just have like two, two copies. Anyway, so I, I was told that, you know, some people might want them, but uh, didn't get them. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk, um, I'm hoping maybe, you know, keep it down to below 20 minutes, 20, maybe 15 at this point, because I've already, so, um, if that's all right with you, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll just kind of read some stuff here, and maybe uh, some, some passages from the, from the book, and then, um, you know, if I keep it short, then maybe we'll have some time for, uh, you know, discussion afterwards, you know, you might have questions or comments or something like that. Oh, and another thing I like to do, you know, like I said, I haven't done this for a long time, but I always want to do I want to remind people that, you know, Monty is useful for us because he's going to remind us of the big sacrifice of a lot of people, a lot of men and women. Uh, in Artsakh, men and women from the Republic of Armenia. And so let's use him, if, if we could, as a reminder that a lot of people, I'm seeing faces, I'm thinking of names right now. A lot of people um, have, you know, died in the course of that, uh, in, the, in the course of the, the, the war in Artsakh, and, um, and most recently, even most recently, these, these young kids, these, these boys, really, uh, who died in the most recent war, uh, really, I uh, you've seen pictures of those guys, it just uh, really gets it. Right, you guys know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so let's remind ourselves of that, um, that, that, um, that Monty can symbolize for us the enormous sacrifice that lots and lots of people uh, have, have made. So, um, okay, so we were born, um, that is to say, our, my two sisters and Monty and I were born a year and a half, so Monty and I were a year and a half apart, I'm a year and a half older than him. Uh, in, a, in Tulare County, California, a little, well, what at that time was a little city called Visalia, and some people have been through there on Highway 99, and at that time it was called the Raisin Cap, the Walnut Capital of the World, the Walnut Capital of the World. Yeah, that was our point of pride. At least, you know, it never struck me as a point of great pride. Anyway, to a lot of people there, so it was a point of pride. And um, so it was in Tulare County. Um, and near about 45 miles south of Fresno, uh, my great-grandmother, 
arrived here at the age of three in 1883. My great great granduncle Jacob Serovian arrived in Fresno in 1879. 1879. So we go back a long time in Fresno. We go back a long time in Fresno. Um, on my mom's side, on my father's side, we go back to um, 1913. They got they got out just. Uh, uh, he did. His family did. But the extended family, of course, was met with the fate of so many of our extended families, right? Um, so um, yeah, that's where we were born, and. Um, so November 25th, 1957, uh, and uh, it was a poor, poor area. Still one of the poorest uh, counties in uh, in California, Tulare County, and also the uh, Fresno County. And um, but uh, we didn't know at the time, of course. You know, um, looking back, what what I recall were the cartwheels we played in, in in that area, it's a rural area, cartwheels. Leapfrog, hide and seek, dicondra flower necklaces, empatigo, if you know what that means, uh, we did it at an early age, stubbed toes, and games of chase lit by the summer sun. Digging holes for hideouts was a process imbued with infinite significance, though our work collapsed with the first heavy rain. Straddling boughs, boughs branches of trees, we nod nectarines amid luminescent leaves and dancing shadows. We slid down grassy slopes on flattened cardboard boxes, wrestled in flooded orchards, and chased quail, jackrabbits, and blue-bellied lizards through the trellises. On summer evenings, we would stretch out on warm asphalt, stare at the stars, breathe the fragrance of orange blossoms and weed oil, and listen to the whistle of distant uh, trains. This was before smartphones. Um, so uh, we were, I guess you'd call it an, an assimilated family. I was, last, uh, last night I was just listening to Richard Pogopi and Kept Time on, uh, on, on YouTube. The music, that was our music. And uh, here in LA I found out people hate that music. Like, that was our Armenian music. And I loved it. Even as a kid, that was our music. You know, kept time, uh, kept time Fresno, kept time Dinuba, and so forth. Yeah, as a little kid, I loved that music, and now I hear it now, that old mu music, you know, and um, it's just uh, so moving to us. Our grandparents spoke Turkish, a little bit of Armenian. I thought it was Armenian, until later on I found out this is Turkish, <laughs> they spoke Turkish. Um, yeah, so they were... Mm, Farm workers, my dad's side, farm workers. My mom's side was small farmers. Um, my dad started working in the fields at five because he was the youngest, so he was spoiled. The others started when they were four. Three of them, three of his siblings died uh, in infancy because of, they were living in a uh, dirt floor. Uh, actually, it was a um, one of these water towers, these clapboard water towers. You still see them out there; they're falling to pieces. Yeah, and that whole family lived in a clapboard water tower. And, and so my grandma, my dad's mother, she, when my dad was the youngest, my dad was the youngest, and Vahe knows my dad, um, and so she gave birth to her eighth uh, child, uh, alone, on the dirt floor. She um, buried, the, buried the placenta, washed the baby, fed the baby, and had a hot dinner on the table by the time my grandpa came back to the fields. So that's what he did. Yeah, those are the conditions under which they lived in Fresno at the time. Bam, they were particularly poor, I guess. As far as, now growing up, we of course were different. Uh, uh, our generation was different. My dad was uh, in, in Lebanon. And Monty said, you know, he said, this is a generations-long struggle we're involved in here. He's telling my dad. And um, he said, if you guys had started, if you guys had started, we'd be a generation up, ahead. My dad said, food. We were trying to get food. You know? What are you talking about? Revolution. We wanted to eat. <laughs> you know, when we were kids. We, we didn't have this. 
So anyway, that was their, their conversation. Um, so as far as our ethnic background is concerned, we had this vague sort of understanding that we were Armenians. But what that meant wasn't clear to us, say, through, through um, junior high school. Um, outside of the kitchen, our parents weren't especially informed about the subject, and there were no grandparents around the house at that time to fill us in. Our only living grandparent was mom's mother, Grandma Jemima, and since 1964, she had been living in an old folks' home east of Fresno in a eucalyptus grove behind a rickety cedar barn that looked like a shipwreck. The home was full of brittle old country types, gnarled Armenians with a language and tears we didn't understand. They played pinochle, and one of the best players was a man with pointy ears who had a head like a medicine ball and a permanent scowl. Money bags, they called him, and he was rumored to have buried riches someplace, maybe in the old country. Several of the old ladies rocking on the porch had weird blue tattoos on their chins and the tops of their hands. Another old lady, uh, an old lady who was always blessed, dressed in black, Mrs. Cloud, Bolutian, Bolutian. They called her Mrs. Cloud. We called her Mrs. Cloud. Mrs. Cloud. She had a, a tattoo too, but it was on her forearm. She claimed that it was her own handiwork that he, she had punched it into her own skin using a nail and an ink of ashes mixed with spit. The tattoo read 1915. Inch on him, she asked in her mother tongue. What else could I do? Mrs. Cloud did not otherwise seem insane. So it was hard for Monty or me to decide what to think of stories like that. So um, I was just talking, uh, someone asked me the question just, just during dinner about a trip, it's called it one of these, I guess, watershed events, maybe, sort of. Um, a trip that we made, you know, my parents took us to, uh, to our uh, ancestral town of Marzabon. Are there any Marzabonsies here? Raise your hand if you're Marzabonsie. Oh yeah? Anyone else? That's it? No, no other marks of yeah. Great. Okay. And well I'm carpetsy on the other side, so I'm sure there are a lot of carpetsy. Yeah, 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 a lot of carpets. Um, so uh, it was nineteen seventy. Um, that they took us to Marsman. We were living out of a car uh, at that time. Um, my my dad had pulled us out of school and took us to Spain because Spain is cheaper living. It was a Anyway, the story's in the, in the book, so somehow. Anyway, he decided, let's go to, let's drive to Marzabon. And then from Marzabon, he was going to visit some friends, the Palestinian friends in Jordan, and, and do some other stuff, so see friends and stuff. Anyway, um, so we uh, got to Marzabon and um, parked in the center of the town. I guess it's changed, Marzabon has changed a lot since, since 1970. Almost as much time has passed from 1970 to now as passed from the time of the genocide, 1915, to the time we visited the place. And the, the uh, population of, of Marzipan in 1970 was the same as it was in 1915. There's research and stuff. And, uh, Dr. Marsubian from the University of Connecticut has done some, has done some really nice uh, uh, research on this. Yeah, so same population. It was one-third Greek, one-third Armenian, one-third Turkish, and um, and so 1970 is the same because the Greeks and the Armenians have been pretty much, uh, you know, wiped out or pushed out of, and, or, and pushed out of the, uh, of the town. So we get to the center there, and my mom starts to re remember stuff that old people had told her. There it is, there's the clock tower. There's the clock tower, and it's just where, just like they described it. There's a hammam. There's the hammam right there, exactly. There are those pink, those pink towels. That her mother had one of those pink towels. She used it as a, a as a, a tablecloth. And there it is, right there, hanging outside the hammam. It was a towel that they used in the hammam. So they went in the hammam. You yeah, right, a hammam, right? A uh, bath, bath, right? Bath. Okay, so. 
and everything else. So they go in there, and it's all just like the old people said. My mom has never been to this place before, right? But it's all exactly like the old Marzabansis described it. Everything is exactly there. Yeah, and so my dad starts speaking Turkish, you know, um, in you know, Armenian. He starts speaking Turkish, and these, these Turks are, oh yeah, okay, right? And so um, one of them, he hears Ethmany. So he goes, oh, go, go get Makro. So they go, they send a kid out, he goes running off, brings back this guy, a skinny guy, kind of, you know, excited. Um, so he's our, he's our um, Bahram Karabins. Bahram Karabins. So he shows us around. And there it is, there's the church. Somewhere in that yard around the church is our, my ancestor, my mother's side, their graves. The church had these uh, movie posters on it. It was used as a movie house. So that, that was there. And then we drive down, and you, you look down these roads, these, little, these streets, these little narrow cobblestone streets, and there are these um, amazing doors. They're like an oak or something, wood doors with carvings on them. And uh, they have like a, a cross on them like this, but the sides, the cantilevers, you know, the cross pieces are just really crudely kind of chopped off or you know chiseled off in a real crude way. They didn't, didn't even bother to finish it correctly. So you know obviously these are and then they took us to uh, Mr. Karabins took us to uh, the Ashgerian home. That was one of my my mom's my grandmother's family. Ashgerian Ashgerian home and uh, you know so we're standing on the street looking at this place. It's kind of a nice it's an old place. Got the one of these balconies that comes out like this with the carved thing and this huge old um, uh, braided looking uh, a great arbor thing coming out of the ground. Amazing old great thing. I remember that very clearly. Okay, so we're standing there and it's inhabited, right? And then my mom goes, oh, Charlie, you're the kind of guy that does this all the time. You know, why don't you just knock on the door and ask for a tour? And my dad says, watch, no, chat, chat. I'm I'm So it was interesting, yeah, chat, I'm So who knows who was living there? You know, who knows what they're, how they got the house? Maybe they bought it from someone, who knows? But my, my mom's side of that family was, uh, in, uh, so the usual story. So, you know, that kind of made an impression on a kid, you know, you're, 13 years old, standing on the street, looking at your ancestral house, inhabited by who knows who, and you know, you wouldn't dare knock on the door and get a, and ask for a tour of the place. I, I, was, I was sort of thinking, I wasn't monitoring Monty's reactions, these were just my reactions. Anyway, we went to the house, they, they did Yurasu Sedu Tune, they were a very gracious family, the Karabin's family, very gracious family. There was another Armenian family there. I was looking around for like, you know, uh, for sort of hints as to what's going on with this family. I didn't see any like, you know, uh, 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 Virgin Mary pictures or, or crucifixes. I didn't see any pictures of, of um, you know, Mecca or anything yet either. I just didn't see anything there. They, they didn't have anything um, that would indicate exactly what's going on with them. But they did speak Armenian, so, and they were very gracious with us. So my dad said, well, okay, we gotta leave because of the Kurds. Yeah, so supposedly, it's not true, but you know, the Turks were had this whole thing about the Kurds, you know, like the Kurds are gonna attack, the Kurds are gonna, whatever. But between, between Marzaban and Samson, there are no Kurds there. The Kurds are way out, hundreds of miles away. But anyway, my dad said, we, we gotta get in the car, we gotta leave, we gotta the Samson, we gotta get the Samson on the, on the on the coast there, on the Black Sea coast, before the, before the, so we got there, we get to Samson, and my brother and I pitched our tent, he and I lived in a tent when this was going on, in the campground there in Samson, and we just laid down, and the muezzin, you know, the muezzin was calling, you know, Allah Akbar, and all that stuff, okay, so, and you know, it made you very contemplative, and we just sort of sat there, and we were talking, you know, what exactly happened today? What's going on? You know, what's going on here? You know, kids. I guess Monty, well, 70, 
Uh, well, I was just going to turn 14. Monty must have been 12 then, 12 and a half. So, you know, at that age, boys, you know, it's a beautiful evening. The muezzin is there. We're kind of thinking, trying to think things through. What's going on? Anyway, that, that thinking went on for a long time with Monty. But for my part, I doubt that Monty had an epiphany in Marzavan. I doubt that it was a big, that, 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 that day he had a big change of mind. I doubt that that happened. Perhaps what he had confronted that day, or in solitary reflection sometime thereafter, maybe years after that, was a riddle. When my parents asked the old lady, Karabins, the matriarch of the family, the oldest person in the family, she might have been 80 years old, um, you know, where, how come there are no more Armenians? She looked genuinely puzzled, and she goes, I don't know. She goes, uh, and then she goes, like, one day they just, she goes, we, were, we had Armenian neighbors, and one day, you know, they were gone. So, um, well, I think what Monty confronted maybe that day or later on, thinking about it, was the intolerable ambiguity of that defaced wooden door of a, of a home with a bare mantle. That is to say, with no pictures of the family, with no pictures of, no crucifixes, no pictures of Mecca, and of an old woman holding up the palm of her empty hands. So, um, well, Monty went to, uh, he was a precocious kid. He was, he was, put it this way, he was one of the boys, the first boy to jump off the highest rock into the swimming pool. See, he was that kid. The kid gets up to this highest rock, jumps off the, jumps off the highest rock of it. He always had that, 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 that way of doing things. And, um, yeah, so he, um, he left home at 15. He uh, was, uh, uh, I guess, he had something in him, right? So he left home, left home. He lived in Japan for a year. He traveled around Southeast Asia. He went to Vietnam just before, uh, just before the National Liberation Front uh, took uh, Saigon. Um, he was in a Buddhist monastery in Korea for a while. And he came back at the age of 16, 16 and a half, 17. Went to Berkeley, originally as a math major, a mathematics major. Um, then he changed to a, a ancient Asian history and archaeology. And um, ancient Asian history and archaeology, that was his major. And um, finished off in two and a half years and uh, headed to Lebanon, straight out, headed straight out to Lebanon. He took Turkish classes. He didn't speak Armenian. Tur uh, Turkish was his fourth language, if you count English, fourth language. His second language was Spanish. His third language was Japanese, so Turkish is his fourth. He went to Lebanon to learn another language, Ar <laughs> Armenian. And so um, he'd heard that there was war. We had cousins there. We'd been there before as little kids visiting our, our, our cousins. And um, he heard that the Armenian community there was uh, facing a lot of problems. He also heard that, that Iran was headed for revolution. And he had a lot of Iranian friends, and Armenian Iranian friends, so he knew a lot about that. So he decided to go there. And um, so he was in Lebanon. Then he went to Iran just before the revolution, worked in, Le in Iran for a while, back and forth, Lebanon and Iran. And um, he was doing Baha Gutun. There are some Bahaks, but the Bahaks, Urch Hamoud Bahaks, raise their hands. Other Urch Hamoud Bahaks. Any guards from Urch Hamoud? Right, over there? Okay. Okay, we got a couple. Yeah, um, unsung heroes. Yeah, un unsung heroes. In there. Uh, sometimes I think we don't make a big enough deal about these guys. Most of them are guys uh, who uh, who did Baha Gutun. Teenagers sometimes, sometimes older than that. You know, spend all night sitting in a lobby of a of a building waiting for something to happen, for something to go bang in the night. Yeah, night after night, you know, two nights, three nights a week, four nights a week. Okay, so Monty did that. I mean, he did it more like five nights or six nights a week. He 
he volunteered. So he got this reputation of being a crazy person. Why would anyone, they only have to do it three or four times a week. Why did they do it five times or six times a week? And there was fighting, there was street fighting, and Monty, uh, so there was street fighting. It was the Civil War in Lebanon, okay? And um, um, yeah, so he was there. And then, um, and um, so some of our fellow, and I, I was there for a while, just a, a, like a you know, year and a little more than a year off and on over the course of a couple of years. I did a little bit of that Baha Gujun, and there was some fighting that was going on, street fighting. So some of our fellow guards at our, uh, at our building, Otanabi Shane, air, air, airplane building, uh, that's where our, our guard post was in Naba, in Naba, right? My daughter was there last uh, summer, and she sent me pictures. Otanabi Shen is still there with the Otanabi. The Damurzi Gendron is no longer Katayi Yeah, Exactly. That's right. And that, those guys, those were mean ones. <laughs> those were mean guys across the street. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, so Monty was there, you know, waiting. Uh, for something to happen. Some of our fellow guards at airplane building liked Monty's gung-ho spirit. He would show up on time and chipper to cover for militiamen who excused themselves from guard duty complaining of stomach aches and domestic duties. To others, though, Monty was bad news. One evening, as we sat at a small restaurant eating food, uh, a fellow militiaman staggered through the door and swayed in front of us. He smelled of booze. We were troublemakers, he slurred. Kids who had appeared on the scene one fine day, all charged up and ready to fight. But Burj Hamoud was his home. His family and job were here, and he was trying to build a future for his children. He wanted us to understand that, unlike us, he couldn't afford to sit around all night itching for a chance to charge a rifle. So, um, long story short, Monty ended up in the ranks of, oh, lots of stuff happened. There was street fighting, there was all kinds of stuff. And when I say that Monty was really, uh, uh, the joke among Monty and his fellow Bahads was, we will we'll never, we'll never turn 30. 30 is not going to happen. And the tragedy of it is some of them, you know, that I could have mentioned, that I could mention did not turn, turn to 30. Anyway, um, you know, fighting and all of that stuff. Um, so, um, yeah, so uh, he ended up in the ranks of the Kapni Panat. It was this little armed group at the time. Uh, never quite understood. Personally, I mean, people are going to have a different opinion. I never quite understood the allure. Never quite understood what was going on. It seemed to me that, anyway, um, didn't quite understand what their goals were. Anyway, but he ended up with them. And I ended up with them because the way things were set up, not with them, I was sort of had to leave at the same time Monty left, and my, and, and my sister did too, she was there, um, because of um, because the way things were, if one person disappears and he shows up later on, then you can be held responsible because he's alive himself with some, this kind of thing, complicated thing, so I had to, anyway, I joined the PLO, so I was a fighter in the South, I joined the Palestinian Resistance Organization and received training on fighting against the uh, against the those people who come and bomb civilians all the time, shred them and incinerate them. Yeah, I'd seen that happen a few few times too many. I decided, well, under these circumstances, that would be a good thing to do. Just try to help defend Lebanon, you know. And to this day, I think that Lebanon is kind of my second home. I uh, it's just the heartbreaker. Lebanon is a heartbreaking. I know a lot of Armenians leave Lebanon and they come here and they say, ah, I don't never want to go back. Ah, ah. They have no connection at all. That's fine. You know, people are different. I, I am. Lebanon is a heartbreaker for me. And I'm. And when my daughter got back this summer from Lebanon, she she goes, Lebanon. You know, there's it's it's something. You know, it's really an amazing country. The people are amazing with all of their problems, all of their petty pettiness. And the cruelty and everything else, still it's an amazing, an amazing place. Okay, so then you can read the middle chapters of the book to find out what's going on. Long story short, bad things went on. And then um, Monty uh, 
ended up in a prison in Paris, a prison outside of Paris, a bad prison, Fresnes. There are good prisons, there are bad prisons, this was a bad prison. And there were a lot of uh, prison strikes. I could have written a book on that prison situation. Amazing. The sociology of prison. There was a Marseillaise Armenian who was like running that place. He was a prisoner, but he had all of the guards on his, uh, on, on his payroll. And he could like tell them to do this, do this, and this. And Monty was thrown into a solitary confinement once because of a, a participation in a uh, in a prison strike. And um, the guy, this, this uh, Congolese guy, that that was a fellow prisoner, who was bringing him his food, brought him a plate of stuff, big plate of all kinds of stuff, you know. <laughs> first of all, and then in it was a letter. And the food was a letter from this guy saying, introducing himself and saying, hey, blah, 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 we got your back, and so on and so forth. So anyway, lots of other stuff happened too at Flaine. So he was there for about four years between Flaine and another prison called Poissy. Flaine was the one where the, the, the big action took place. Got out through a long and circuitous, circuitous um, chain of events. Do a little shout out to another unsung hero, Shishko, the Monminasian, another Marseillaise Armenian, young guy, among his age, uh, Levon Minasian. Uh, you haven't heard this, his name before, but uh, he's one of these guys, and uh, a doer. <laughs> yeah, he's a, I mean, you can debate how he got things done, but he got things done. Anyway, um, he sprayed Monty through a very improbable crazy scam kind of thing where Monty uh, was at the end of uh, at the end of his term he was in by the way for possess illegal possession of a, of a firearm possession of false uh, documents and illegal entry in, in, in France they threw the book at him they couldn't get him or anything more he was accused originally of trying to sink the Turkish ship in at harbor in Marseille Monty told me later yeah everything was good to go you know, he had a snorkel. He was going to do it himself. His comrades had got him the, the, got him the, the C4 explosives, the sawayak, the detonators, the wires. Everything was all set. This it was going to be a big scandal because uh, this was this this Turkish ship was supposedly a, a merchant marine ship, but it was actually they got the intelligence that it was full of. Of, of military stuff, and France at that time wasn't supposed to allow it, so they blew it up in harbor, with nobody in it, of course, right? They blew it up in harbor, then it'll show, you know, hey, look what France has allowed, they've allowed this thing. Okay, anyway, got everything, it didn't happen. He had, photo, and they, but they didn't have enough evidence on him to convict him of that, so he only spent four years in jail, okay? Got out, he ends up in Yemen, Yemen, Aden, right? Uh, it ends up in Yemen through some Palestinian comrades. So, you know, they called him Ajnabi. So he was a, um, his Arabic, he spoke with a heavy accent. So they're going, what the heck is going on? He was introduced. He's go going without a passport, right? The United States had refused to grant him a passport. He was traveling without a passport. He went there, no laissez passer, no passport, no visa, no nothing. Ends up in um, Yemen introduced to the president of Yemen at the time, with him, something, Mohammed, something or other, as a Palestinian, and a hero of the Palestinian resistance, because Monty had done a lot of stuff. He fought in, uh, against, he had been a commander in, uh, in, in Lebanon during the 1982 war. He had been in charge of a, uh, of a, of a coastal emplacement, gun emplacement. It's a, that's another story. Anyway, so, introduced to that. So, you know, there he is in Yemen, Eating malakhiye, right? <laughs> so, he is in a Moscow, Moscow outside of Aden. Yeah, so when I hear about Yemen, I think about this. Anyway, and then this and that. And it was one disaster after another. He would go someplace, and the place would fall to pieces. Like uh, Warsaw, uh, Prague, uh, you know, uh, Belgrade, uh, you know, and on and on. <laughs> the place was falling to pieces. Time. And um, and he was and the way he was getting money, we were trying to send him a little bit of money. I wish I'd sent him more. I didn't know about this. I heard about this. But they were collecting cans for deposit, 
collecting cans for deposit. And his wife was telling me that one day in, um, or I, I think it was, um, where was it? It was in, uh, it wasn't in ha Havar? Anyway, I think it might have been Havar in Yugoslavia. <clears throat> they took their money from collecting cans, you know, they were going to go buy, a, they, they stood in front of a bakery, a pastry shop, counting their money, looking at the pastries in the window. Monty and his wife are counting the pastry, counting the money, looking at the pastry. He said a guy inside there saw them doing that. He, Monty he didn't have enough money. He put it back in his pocket. He runs out. He puts some pastries in their hands. <laughs> Here, take this. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, that's, there was literally hand to mouth, I guess. That's the, the, the moral of that story. Okay, so anyway, trying as hard as you could to get that to Hayasa. Trying hard to get to Hayasa. Okay? So, we got Hayasa at that time. Arrived 1990, finally, after rocking around, you know, the Warsaw Pact countries are falling, you know, everything, the war, one damn thing after another. Uh, civil unrest. He didn't have any damn money. His, his group is falling to pieces. The group that he was a member of falling to pieces. And it, it ended up it was he, he and, and uh, Levon Minassian were, were the group. Two people. It's a two people group. What happens when you have a two people group compared, composed of Armenians? What happens? That's what happened. They split. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, finally they got the, he got the Hayastan. There's a, another story. He got the Hayastan under a, uh, a, uh, an Irish passport. Irish comrades had given him a passport. These comrades from a group called the uh, Irish Republican National Liberation Army. Yeah. They were like a line of the provost. It was an Irish passport, stolen Irish passport. So Monty was, so this guy arrived from Moscow. His name was Timothy Sean McCormick. I guess I should show some pictures of Monty so you can get the picture here. And that's what Monty's legal status was up until the time of his death. He was Timothy Sean McCormick. This is Monty when he was a kid. What is it? His, uh, oh, okay. This is December 1960 on his birthday, obviously. Here he is in Japan. This must have been 1973. He's in Japan. Told his mother he's not going to come back to the United States for a while. Um, here is his wedding. It happened in 1980. I'm sorry. It happened in. Uh, 1991, August 1991, where, oh yeah, oh, anyway, well, now let me get it. Well, actually, you can see here, this is Timothy Sean McCormick. That's Timothy Sean McCormick right there. So. <laughs> In uh, Yugoslavia, he, he, he ran into it, an Irish couple, and they're going, who are you? Uh, I'm Timothy Sean McCormick. What? Gives him this half-baked story he makes up about my, my mom's Pakistani and my dad's Irish and, and the guy goes, oh, you're a brother, you're an Irish brother, an Irish brother. So this ridiculous situation where these two Irishmen are like, you know, they're, they're uh, toasting to, you know, free Ireland and all that stuff. Anyway, um, so, <clears throat> Timothy Sean McCormick. Yeah, so he arrived and he immediately started doing stuff. So he didn't go to arts off until 91, um, fall of 91, September 91. But before that, people don't know, he was up in the north, in Lori, and on the, on the border. The, uh, the, what, you know, it was partisan warfare, right, at that time. It wasn't quite conventional warfare yet. There wasn't, the armories hadn't been completely looted, so they didn't have armor. They didn't have heavy guns and armor. The Azeri uh, brigades and the Armenian brigades were fighting each other, against each other, and the Azeris had taken over, you know, land in Armenia, right, on, on the border. Areas there, you know, everybody knows about Artsvashem, but there were other areas there that are, that Azeris had taken over Armenian land in the north. Monty went up there, and you know, he was a colonel in the um, in a in a Lebanese. It was called the um, what was that organization called? Zahir Al-Khatib's organization. Monty had, had received a lot of military training by then. 
years earlier, he did a lot of military training. So he put that military training to work and figure out what to do. I have a feeling it was just some very basic stuff that these guys didn't have. Hey, dig trenches here. Not deep enough. Dig in deeper. I thought I told you to dig those trenches deeper. How deep? Here. Come back. Dig them deeper. <laughs> and he would say this. This is the border of our country. Dig that trench deeper. You need to be able to run through the trench without getting shot. Stuff like that. I guess that doesn't take too much in the way of sophisticated military preparation to figure out that you need to dig a dig deeper. Anyway, so, um, yeah, so he was doing that. He, he had a jokad called the Hayrena Siragan. Hayrena Siragan jokad. And a uh, number of people that we know, members of this jokad. A jokad is a brigade, right? A partisan brigade. It's not really conventional warfare yet. Uh, and he was doing a lot of that work there. And he was also getting, uh, collecting money uh, for guns. You know, we sent some of our comrades here in, in uh, in Northern California, got money together for crate of Bulgarian uh, rifles, sent a bunch of Bulgarian rifles, right? And um, uh, and so, and then comrades from uh, from France, they sent stuff with something else. They got these fagot. It's a rocket, a wire wire guided rocket. They turned out to be very useful later on. A wire, yeah, no, no, not a katusha. It's a fagot. It's a it's an anti tank wire guided anti tank. Pretty amazing. It's a Russian thing. Anyway, they got those from Gurastan, from Georgia. This and that, making connections, getting weapons together, training people, this and that, next thing. In the midst of all this, they, um, in, like I said, August 91, they got married at Gebhardt. Showed you the picture. That's the picture. Gebhardt. These are all, every single face here, you know, it has meaning. Um, some of them aren't with us any longer. Anyway, um, yeah. And um, then he shipped off. He shipped off for Shahumyan. Shahumyan is the northern part. It's outside of nagorno karabakh proper, but it's, it's an Armenian populated area uh, in north. You know where Shahumyan is. Anyway, and as it turns out, he went there originally because he wanted to go there. And he didn't, and he didn't have the wherewithal. But he went with as a translator for a French journalist, Miriam Gong. So Miriam, he went with Miriam is a French journalist. As a translator, turns out that the night after they arrived, preparations for battle were going. It was going to be a preparation of the biggest battles in that war here to four. Monty saw a lot of clinging and clanging. He knew what preparing for battle looked like. These guys were preparing for battle, so Monty inserted himself in there immediately. Let's see. Let's see what you got. Let's see the arsenal. Blah blah blah, da, 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 check the things out, and I, then they start. Erkej, Manashit, Bozluk, three villages, they, Karadetsi, they, so they went against it. The area had been uh, ethnically cleansed of Armenians, but there were a lot of Armenians who wanted to get back in that area, and they were fighting, locals fighting. So Monty fought on their side to take those villages back. The first villages fell. The second, the third village, was a hill surrounded. Those guys fought like the Dickens. The Azari defenders fought like, like fought hard that third battle. And uh, finally they were evacuated by a, a helicopter. The helicopter came down and just took them on and took them off that hill. So Monter wrote me a letter after that. He said, this is the first time we've made an advance in like, you know, centuries. <laughs> this is the first time we've made an advance in centuries. So Okay, anyway, um, ended up getting the command for Marduni. I wish I had a, I should have brought a, a map here. Marduni is in the eastern area, eastern part of, um, of uh, nagorno karabakh It's surrounded on 270 degrees uh, by Azari, uh, by the plain and Azari forces. Azari forces had unbroken logistical lines of support. They could replenish themselves whenever they wanted to. And, um, and so uh, his Monty's uh, job was defense. Defend the city, or the town, rather, the town of uh, Marduni. And um, 
And oh, here, here's a fight. Here's a picture of them when they were fighting for Manashi Bo Bozlu. And uh, okay, I don't know where this it was one, in one of those. So um, this is Monty here. He doesn't have a rifle. They didn't have enough guns to go around. He had to get this rifle. Yeah, and he had to get this rifle from the enemy. And at this time, he didn't have one at the beginning of the fight. Um, this is Martini, when Monty was commander of Martini, with his wife, Seta. Yeah, so that was uh, in Martini. He was in Martini for over a year. Heavy, heavy fight. Heavy fight. Two battles a day on two different fronts. Three battles a day on three different fronts, crossing from one front to the next. Battles involving seven tanks, 12 tanks on the Azari side, 20 tanks, Gulablu, 20 tanks on the Azari side. Uh, that Monty, Monty's idea was, he was very impressed by tanks. Yeah. We need tanks, so get them. So he told him, so he told his guys, don't melt the tanks. Those are our tanks. Azaris have them temporarily. Those are our tanks. They started at, at the railroad station. There was a railroad station repair shop that they, they re revamped that. Monty didn't look through it, but uh, his, his, uh, the, the, the people in, um, in Stepanaker did. They turned it into a tank refurbishing station. They would get these blown up tanks, salvage the parts that were useful. They had a, they had a special armored uh, bulldozer that would drag them around. So. Anyway, and then they could use all the heavy equipment there to refurbish these things. And then they also had an electrical thing there where they could refurbish the optics, the high-tech optics of the tanks. So they had this thing going. The idea was to get tanks going, get them going. He was given a couple of tanks uh, by uh, start, sort of starter tanks. Um, but by the end of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of Monty's service there, they had over 20 between troop carriers, BMPs, and uh, battle tanks, they had maybe 20 of these techniques, a bed and, and, and so the various kinds of heavier armored vehicles, they had maybe 20. Most of them were, not all of them, most of them were captured from the, captured from the enemy. Some of them still had, all of them still, that I saw, they still had the Azari marking on them. Azari flags on the side, the, you know, the deal and all this stuff on them. Azari writing, you know, Russian writing for Azari identification. One of them had blood all over the inside of it. The war was going so fast, they didn't even have time to clean out the previous tank crew's blood. Uh, you know, this was the thing that was happening. The, the tank commanders, some of them were, were trained in the Red Army, some of them weren't. Some had to learn that on the job, and uh, you graduate if you survive the battle, right? <laughs> That's graduation for you. Anyway, um, then there was, uh, in uh, early spring 2003, there was a, um, I'm sorry, 1993, early spring 1993, rather, um, there was the uh, famous, uh, I guess maybe famous, maybe not, uh, battle of, um, to take over uh, Ho Chan Lu. Uh, I'm sorry, not Ho Chan Lu. That was a, another story. I write about that. And uh, um, Kel Bajar. Kel Bajar. Kel Bajar. Okay, so Kel Bajar is the area between the Republic of Armenia, just to the east of it, and Karabakh, which is sort of an island, and then there's that area in between. So Monty's idea was we take this. We've got to take this because it's a logistical and tactical thing. We've we got to take this area. It was. It was um, Occupied largely by courts, so there was that battle, and this was a hard, hard fought battle. This was uh, like five days, four days, five days, no sleep, hardly any, hardly any um, food, running, 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 rushing, and the, the, they were up against uh, persistent, persistent fighters. These weren't guys who would turn and run. So, um, you know, they, they were, so anyway, they took over uh, that area. They united, uh, that, the big landmass that united Armenia. 
So, uh, yeah, and, and then a few months later, Monty was killed in battle. In battle. So the story is in uh, one of the last chapters, the second to last chapter, something in the book. You know, that's the definitive story, by the way. People have questions about that. The definitive story. And people change their stories, people's memories change, uh, people have uh, conspiracy theories. Well, anyway, that's the official one. So that's, uh, that's, uh, um, that's, I guess, the story in a nutshell of Monty's life. And um, Monty's life was tied up with many other of his fighters, including this guy right here. This is Monty's chauffeur. Comitas. Comitas. He was. He survived the battle that Monty was killed in. Um, he survived with, this is a picture of him in the hospital recovering from it. Um, but he was killed a couple of years later in a landmine. On, on one patrol, he was killed in a landmine. This is the family of Monty's very good comrade, um, Saudi Beg. Saudi Beg here. I mean, I'm giving you examples of very good people who, were, who died in that war, so this guy had seven kids and so forth, and they, and um, so Saudi Big, there, yeah. Um, oh, this is a picture. Of, I think I took this picture. Someone took it of uh, Monty's. This is Monty's um, opulent living uh, conditions uh, in the in the last days of his life. Uh, an old, World War II vintage, or World War I vintage, and most of them got rifle that Monty had confiscated. I didn't tell stories about like the corruption and the mafiosos in the middle of the war who were stealing fuel, stealing tank fuel, diesel. Devox is stealing diesel while they're under attack on the border a few kilometers away. Stealing the diesel for the black market. Yeah, that happened too. Lots of stuff like that. Stealing military supplies for resale. I don't know how Monty did it. He, he, you know, I would have been driven crazy about the whole situation. Most of the people were very good, but there were some real. Here's a picture you've probably seen before. Anyway, uh, Monty would be. So, um, yeah, uh, like I said, there were lots of uh, good people fighting Devatsis, fighting for Devatsis, fighting for um, self defense, really, self defense. You know, I was pretty impressed by a lot of these people, including fighters in Martini. I remember a couple of years later, one of them did a toast to Azari children, to the children of Azerbaijan, a fighter who had seen battle, whose, whose friends had been killed. The first toast, the first toast we were eating outside. He said, this is a toast to the children of Azerbaijan. <laughs> Anyway, um, now if I, 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 okay, so I'm going to wrap up right now. Sorry, I probably went over, lost track of time, but I do want to say one thing here. So I'm here talking about this and that. Um, Monty never did. Monty had war stories. There is a, a great, I, actually I looked for it just, just, just this evening before I came down here, I couldn't find it, but there used to be a great uh, video on YouTube of Monty on his birthday in 1992, his last birthday. 1992, right? Um, in Yerevan, uh, talking about the wars, that, the, the big battle, the big battle that had taken place uh, in near in and around Martini, that had just taken place in September of uh, 92, and he talks for about maybe 20 minutes because someone's asking him, his sister-in-law is asking him, what happened? Oh, that was easy, right? And Marty goes, "You don't each each to do." <laughs> she said, well, those Azeris, they don't fight. He said, these people were gray wolves. These people were red, former um, Soviet army people. And they, they were fighting for their homes. They fought like the Dickens. He said, they fought to the end. What do you mean, easy? <laughs> and then he told stories, his war stories. Here's his war stories. And there's this kid from this village, you know, he was 16 years old, we told him to go home, but he showed up on the morning of the fighting, and he was in the Taramat, and an Azari tank goes over the top of the Taramat, and he jumps on top of the Taramat, and he throws the, the 
the hatchet, he throws a grenade down there, the grenade doesn't go off, and he tells this whole story about it. Then he tells another story about this other kid, the sniper who killed all these people. You know, bang, 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 direct shot, young kid. Then he tells another about from some other book. Then he tells another story about some other guy from another. Then he tells another story about this, this woman who was a, a cook who went to the front line. Then he tells another story about this other person, and this guy who got killed, and this person who was wounded, and this guy here, and this guy here, and this guy here. 20 minutes pass. He hasn't said a word about what he did. Not one word. It's like he was a spectator watching from it. He never, his war stories never included him. His war stories never included him. He, 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 would, he could tell war stories. They never included him. And then uh, there's a, a thing that's actually on videotape. I wasn't there when it happened. An interviewer from a TV station goes, Monty, how do you want to be remembered? And what did he say? What do, what do you want people to remember about you? Boys make fun. I don't want not one thing. I don't want people to remember one thing about me. Nothing. And, and if you knew Monty, you'd know that he wasn't joking. I mean, he meant that, you know, he didn't want it. So anyway, little uh, stories of, uh, of this guy that we all miss. I think we tell these stories. I tell these stories. I don't tell them for Monty. Monty would hear, he wouldn't like it. But I, I tell these stories because it's for us. Right? It's for us. It's not for him. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention. I went over the time. If you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Can't guarantee that I can answer questions. Cannot guarantee that I can answer questions. But, yeah, anyway. Oh yeah, being, being, yeah, 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 right, right. Anyone have any uh, reminiscences or any questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I do. Uh, Mr. Melkonian, you never talk, uh, talked about, I'm sorry to mention this, how you were killed. Um, there are rumors that CIA organized it. There are rumors that Vasquez Sarkisian shot him in the back. Vasquez Sarkisian? No. Uh, Vasquez Sarkisian was in Moscow at the time. Uh, and, uh, and, and he wouldn't have done it anyway. Vasquez wouldn't have done it. Not, not, I mean, you know, I know people can be pretty bad, but uh, no, Vasquez would never have done that. That didn't happen. The CIA, no, that didn't happen either. He, uh, I believe your brother was smart enough not to turn me his back to, to, to the enemy that he got shot in the back but this was an inside job did you research it did i research it <laughs> yeah uh, so no he was he wasn't shot in the back he it was right here and a large piece of shrapnel from a bmp1 a smoothbore smoothbore a cannon uh the, uh, the case of it, the case not the case of it, Anyway, he was he had a, spiral, a large spiral piece of shrapnel that ricocheted off of the thing and hit him here. Yeah. It was during a, uh, a um, firefight, I think that's the proper term, a firefight on June 12, 1993 in Marysville, at the intersection out there. There were, I talked with, uh, I, was the, I wasn't there at the time, I talked a couple of days later to all of the people who were in, the, in his police, in his, in his staff car at the time, who had lived, all of them. Uh, a couple of days later, I spoke to a captured Azari P POW, uh, a young man, and uh, what he said lined straight up with, with what I gathered from everything else. Everything was exactly right, the whole schedule. Uh, there's no, no question. Really, I mean, there's no, I mean, there's never, there's always like less than 1%, at least less than 1% doubt, sure, but, uh, you know, this is less than 1%. Okay, I, uh, I knew you as a kid, and your brother, and your cousins as well, uncle, uh, and Blanche and all. I lived in Martelia for years. Oh, yeah, oh. Okay, uh, and in fact, I celebrated my first 
Thanksgiving dinner oh. with your family at your uncle's house. Oh, at, at Uncle Sam's house. Uncle Sam. Okay. Oh, great. Yeah, and I celebrated uh, Christmas at the toy shop that there was next to the Oriental Theater. Oh, wow. Okay, great. Wow, interesting. Still out on each I don't need you. Yeah, and I was at your cousin's wedding. Which and one? I met your brother there. Oh, you, which one? Uh, uh, the oldest uh, cousin you have. Milton? No, Milton. Milton, Milton. Milton. Okay. Milton. Yeah. Ah, okay. Interesting. And uh, uh, my memories are very fail uh, failing me now at this age, but uh, he was uh, always a rebellious kid. Marty? Uh, I don't know if he was rebellious. You know, I'm not sure he was real rebellious. Well, anyway, yes, sir. Yes, you had your hand up. Yes. I'm not sure Monty was. I'm not sure Monty was rebellious. No. Uh, I, I don't think he was really. I think he was a very kind of a. To be honest, I don't think he was rebellious. I think he was sort of a. Um, I've met a lot of people like this. It's just sort of a discipline, and um, he's got his right and he's got his wrong, and that's it. Yeah. He got correction. Monty, he was that time in Ardan area which is after they captured that land, they captured that area, mm -hmm. they were putting out, it was his last pain bay, which is Monte, he said to his troops, go back, get Kasi, al Kashvete, they put out there Kashvetan, make a pain bay with the south, go at pain bay, as in their pain bay, you have other nature, Gantes were men, Panagi, Ragnar took each connect pastor. What you've been doing here? In that time, they shot, they actually hit him with the bazooka to the rocks, and the piece of rocks went to his head. And I was the first witness. I went and I pulled it out, and I saw that part from his gang went out. But Salibek, he was that time with him in other, which is freedom fighter. But whatever rumor it's happened, and also, Vasquez Sarkisya, he hugged Bonte with love. He said, I love you. You are another great Armenian. Vasquez Sarkisya was another great fighter. Yeah, Do I not think, give those rumors. I don't think Vasquez Sarkisya would ever have done it. But like I said, he was in Moscow in any case. Hi. So. Um, so kind of like what Berge had said in his introduction, me and my friends sometimes we talk about, well, what if the war were to start again? Would we go? And some people talk about, you know, that they would go. And I'm curious now, what is it about him that motivated him to do that? Because it's pretty exceptional. Was it like because he was a socialist and he felt like revolutionary about it? Was it because he was a nationalist? Was there another motivation that maybe we haven't talked about? Yeah. Um. There are a lot of things that people say about Monty that uh, are not accurate, but I, I'll tell you one thing that is accurate. One thing that is accurate about Monty, he loved Armenia and Armenians. I mean, he didn't like individual Armenians, no, but he loved Armenians. <laughs> In the abstract, he really, uh, he had this crazy, almost, um, like devotion to the Armenian. He's not the only person. I can mention a few other people like this too. But he did. He had it. This is true about. This is a myth about. Well, not a myth. This is a legend about Monty. That this one happens to be true. He did. I never understood it. I never. To be honest, I never understood what was going on. But he, for one reason or another, he had. He was utterly devoted to. He was utterly devoted to the Armenian nation. And, 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 and so, you know, if he was a socialist, yeah. and he wrote about this too, it was because he felt that that was the right thing for Armenia. It was something that, yeah. that, would, that Armenia should have, and, you know, and so forth. And the same with everything else. Was he a nationalist? He, of course, would say, no, I'm not a nationalist. He would say, no, I'm a patriot. He, was, he would have said that. Um, it's a matter of semantics. Maybe. So I don't know, but the, the, you asked a question, I, so my answer, I don't know for sure, but I do know something about Monty. He was, he was utterly devoted to his nation. Yes. 
who was covering the war in Karabakh. And that lady, she came right to town and sat down in church fundraising for the Armenian cause, the war in Karabakh. So from there, talking to her, I found out about your brother. So we're talking today here. Why Monty did this? Why Monty did that? We all are selfish people here. We all talking about uh, my house. I have to have three houses. I have to have a BMW, Mercedes. We forgot ourselves that we are not Armenian anymore. This man gave his life for Armenia, not for anything else. We are selfish people. We forgot the massacres, we forgot the genocide, we forgot everything. We came here, oh, I like to have a comfortable life. How many people went from here to fight there? There were Bulgarian journalists when she came, a good friend with his brother, she married for an Armenian commander, and she is now an Armenian living in Armenia. Okay? And don't forget that if anything happened in Armenia, future war with Azerbaijan, which one is going to happen in the future, how many will forgive or go there to fight? Most probably 1%. That's it. Thank you. That's a little harsh. Uh, I remember Monty telling me, um, I remember Monty telling me, we were talking, you know, and so he says, you know, self-defense. He said, the Armenian the Armenian party was self-defense. It was a self-defense committee. It was self-defense, and and the uh, and the uh, Hunchakian party, which my which our maternal uh, grandfather was a member of, the Hunchakian party, that was a self-defense committee. The Dashnaktagan party, these were self-defense. These were village communities. The village committees for the self-defense. Well, the, the important thing, sir, is that is that that Stepana Kirtsis, when fighting happens, they step up. And when when Martin sees when that happens, they step up. When people from Ashan, the village of Ashan, or when these when the villages are under attack, they step up. That's the important thing. It's it's not that um, surprising, at least to me it's not surprising. I mean, people want comfortable lives, you know, what else? Uh, but um, the important thing is that, you know, uh, people looking for their comfort, comfortable lives, for their security, they're going to defend their village. They're going to defend their village, they're going to defend their land, that's what's important. I'm not sure that, you know, 15 people from the diaspora going over there, it might be more trouble than there were, really, if fighting breaks out. But, but um, you know, the important thing is that the people the people defend their land, defend their land. I, I don't know, that's in my, in my mind, that's what happens because, you know, these guys come, Monty and, and um, you know, Kakechan and these guys, they come and guys from Syria that I know, Lebanon that I know, Iran, hard fighting people. So, you know, I could probably count maybe 40, 40 people, um, you know, from the diaspora who I met in 1991, 1993, who, you know, were fighting there from the diaspora, but 40 people, and they were amazing, you know, most of them were pretty amazing people. Right? Um, one of them, by the way, uh, Nubar Lazanian, was killed August 14th in Rajab. One of the comrades that I met in uh, 1993 was killed last August in the fighting in Rajab with the TICO, with the TICO organization, the YPG, fighting against ISIS, fighting against ISIS in the battle for Raqqa. He was killed. He was my age, almost exactly my age. Nubar Rozanya, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of him. Born in Yozgat, born in Yozgat, a guy who fought in Palestine, a guy who fought in Lebanon, a guy who fought in Iraq, a guy who fought in Nagorno-Karabakh, and he was killed fighting to free Assyria from these foreign occupiers, all sides, all sides of foreign occupiers. And he was killed. I don't know if you, if you met, if you met uh, Nubar, a very, uh, just a, 
amazing guy, cheerful, he kind of reminded me a little bit of Monty, very cheerful guy, very soft-spoken, quiet, but a fighter, fought all of his life, born to a poor family. Anyway, I mentioned him, um, what was I getting at? Oh yeah, yeah, so, yeah, I don't think that, if we have to rely on the diaspora, forget it. <laughs> I mean, not militarily, not economically, you know, a nation that has to rely on a diaspora. You know, Liberia uh, relies on a diaspora. Honduras relies on, and if you have to rely on a diaspora, I guess Armenia's in that same, same boat right now, of Liberia and Honduras, but it, it's not a good nation that has to rely on a diaspora. It's the people on the ground who can defend themselves, self-defense. That, that's my feeling. I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I get it. Um, and you're, you're probably right, too. How but... many Armenians are here? How many Armenians are here? You are. Okay. Armenian in your heart or Armenian in your pocket? How many Armenians are here? in your pocket? Uh, I'm just wondering, did uh, Monte have formal military training or was it kind of learning on the job? I don't know. By whom? Okay, so the question was, the question was, did Monte have a did Monty have uh, formal military training? He had, yeah, he, everything from boot camp to special weapons training, explosive demolition, um, all kinds of stuff. Courtesy of the Palestinian resistance of the Lebanese national movement, largely. Courtesy of the, of the Palestinian resistance. Now, uh, Levon Minassian had Russian, had Russian training, so. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to add to all of this, he was devoted Armenian young man who was more crazy than the rest of us and he participated affected from the stories of the genocide so he decided with himself that he's going to fight for the Armenian nation he was a hero yeah that's a simple way of putting it maybe you're right yeah he was a hero. He is a hero. Thank you, thank you. That was a very simple way of putting it. Yeah, that's probably right, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Ben, thank you very much, Dr. I, I have one quick, Mark, thank you. I have one quick last question. Um, can you tell me briefly about the state of Oh, yeah. You see the pictures of the state funeral, like the President of the United States dies? Yeah. Um, what was it like? Um, okay, so the state funeral um, it was about a week after he was killed. Was that the, no, it was about five days, it was the 17th? Uh, June 17th, 1993. Um, the, our family was there, my mom was there, and it was a tough time. There was fighting going on in Mardagir, big battles in Mardagir at the time. So, um, and some of our comrades were on the front line there, and uh, some didn't come back. That, so the funeral happened. And Monty used to say, we got to stop this thing of, when there's a funeral, everybody goes away from the front line and attends the funeral. Forget it, just stay at the front line. Don't attend the funeral. The best way to, you know, to honor these people. He, he said that more than once. Um, yeah, but anyway, there was a lot of people in Yenivan there, a lot of people in 1993. I'm sorry? June 19th. Oh, June 19th. Okay, so it was a week. It was a week, uh, exactly a week later. June 19th, I guess. Yeah. June 12th. June 12th was, he, yeah, yeah, he's talking about the funeral in Yedavon. The funeral. So, yeah, June 19th. And um, so, a big turnout. I don't know, thousands and thousands of people. The whole Karabara was full. It full, you know, full. So, this kind of makes a difference, I guess, for my mom. It made a difference. You know, it made a difference for my mom, seeing all this big turnout. There were some Americans, some people, Americans from the United States there, uh, friends of ours, and one of them, and this long, it's like hours and hours, people were filing past the casket, and at one point he turned to me and he goes, aren't there any fat people in Armenia? This is 1993. This is 1993. 
everyone was dressed in their best rags, their best rags, and um, you know, filing past them. It was, a, it was a very moving thing. And you know what? It is for the living. It's, it was, this is, you know, my mom, it helped. It really did. It was a very moving experience for my mom to see all this devotion. So. Mother Elizabeth Metconia, Montes mom, that day, the time, our hero, they were going to put them to rest. Mom Elizabeth, she was, first she went down to the ground. She don't want Monte to go to the ground. Well, that's because it was so hot. Okay. No, no, no. She <laughs> said she couldn't take it. But anyway, after they put Monte in the ground, that night, people, they come from Arza. They took his body to Yerevan. They come from Arza and they dig it. They will take his body to no, take him back. No, 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 yes, no, sir. No. I was there. I was there. They want to take him back to Marduri. And that was another thing, which is all those boys. They, they dig the ground by their hand at night to get his body to take him to Marduri. So that's the way it is. Amazing story. Thank you so much. Thank you.